translations of Book 1 to, first of all, just give you a sense of the manifold ways in which this text is read, but also to keep you constantly on guard to note that we are reading English translations of a text that was composed in classical Chinese and whose meaning um, is highly contested. So that later on, when we settle on a single translation, you will share with me the suspicion of that translation that one ought to always have of texts being read in translation. The three translations we're going to consider are one by Chad Hansen, one by P.J. Ivanhoe, and one by Red Pine, all translators with very different approaches to the text. So the first lines of the Tao Te Ching read as follows. I'm going to begin with Ivanhoe's translation. A way that can be followed is not a constant way. A name that can be named is not a constant name. So here the focus is on the relationship between language and ways of being. Hansen translates it somewhat differently. He writes, No discourse that can be spoken is a constant discourse. No name that can be spoken is a constant name. So here, where we had the term Tao translated as way by Ivanhoe, Hansen is emphasizing its linguistic character, translating it as discourse. Red Pine, on the other hand, says, The way that becomes a way is not the immortal way, keeping the way language. The name that becomes a name is not the immortal name. And here, Red Pine, we see, is emphasizing this notion of permanence and impermanence. So very different reads for that. But in each case, we have the idea that there's no constant way that things are, no single way to speak, no single stable meaning that signs have. Moving to the second lines in chapter 1, Ivanhoe writes, Nameless, it is the beginning of heaven and earth. Named, it is the mother of myriad creatures. Hansen writes, Lacking names is the beginning of the universe. Having names is the mother of all things. And Red Pine again, The maiden of heaven and earth has no name. The mother of all things has a name. These are very different reads indeed. But in each case, we're worrying about names. We're worrying about signs. And in each case, we can see that there's an emphasis on the text that the world is not primordially signified, that the, that the nature of the universe is not made to be talked about, and that when we apply names to things, we're going beyond the way things are. And for a Taoist, therefore, occluding reality in an important way. The third part of this um, opening chapter in Ivanhoe's translation begins, And so, always eliminate desires in order to observe its mysteries. Always have desires in order to observe its manifestations. Hansen's read is pretty similar. He says, therefore, constantly lack desires in order to observe its mysteries. Constantly have desires in order to view its manifestations. So Hansen and Ivanhoe are both emphasizing the idea of the relationship between desire and reality. If we leave our desires behind and just see reality as it is in a kind of detached way, we'll actually see reality and observe its mysteries. But if we want to observe the way that reality manifests itself in objects, in things that are characterized, in conceptual thought, then that's driven by desire. It's when I want gold that dirt and stones become gold ore. It's when I'm looking for firewood that this whole world of trees and grasses suddenly becomes a forest with cuttable trees. So it's desires that bring about the objects that I care about. But Red Pine has a very different reading of this. He writes, Thus in innocence we see the beginning, in passion we see the end. And he's emphasizing a very different idea with which the Tao Te Ching is pregnant. The idea that the world itself is one that's open to us through a kind of innocent primordial awareness. But all of that ends and goes away, and we lose our connection with reality when we allow our passions to take, to take over, when we allow our desires to take over. The final part of this chapter, Ivanhoe has, their unity is known as an enigma. Within this enigma is yet a deeper enigma, the gate of all mysteries. Hansen Slightly different read. 
These two come together and are differently named. Their unity is known as an enigma. Within this enigma is yet a deeper enigma, creates mysteries and even deeper mysteries. In both of these cases, what's being unified? What's being unified is this primordial, undifferentiated, ineffable nature of reality and this world of distinguished things that we name and describe. Objects, properties of objects, things we want, things we don't want, things we take to be good, things we take to be bad, subject, object. The point, though, is that, there, that these two things are one and the same, experienced in different ways, and that it's the unity of the undifferentiated and the differentiated, the unconceptualized and the conceptualized, that is the greatest mystery and enigma. Red pine slightly different. Two different names for one and the same. The Tao, the primordial way of being, or the many things. The one we call dark, the dark beyond dark, the door to all beginnings. Here we have Tao and Day contrasted. Tao is darkness, something unknown, undifferentiated. Day, virtue, the way we think about things as light. So chapter one introduces us to a number of important Taoist themes. One is that words and names are conventional. They're not constant. Their meanings don't, aren't anchored to reality. They're things that we make up and they can change. That there is a kind of primordial ground for the possibility of thinking. This Tao, this undifferentiated reality that we can't literally describe, but is the basis of our ability to experience and to describe anything. The idea that desire, our own human concerns, bring particular entities into a foreground. Trees step out of a forest, blades of grass out of a lawn, in order for us to conceive of them and to experience them as individual objects. It's our concerns that make them the objects that they are. Reality doesn't come pre-carved into entities for us. And finally, that the negative space, this darkness, this Tao, is the ground of the positive space. The positive stuff emerges from that, and to understand the relationship between that emergent positive emerged through our conceptual constructions and the primordial is the deepest mystery. We're going to turn in a moment to chapter 2 of book 1. And in chapter 2 of book 1, we're going to encounter further Taoist themes. One is going to be the idea of the mutual relativity of things. We're going to see a discussion of the relativity of values to one another, to good, bad, beautiful, and ugly. The mutual dependence of opposites, the idea that we can only characterize something as having a particular quality if we characterize something else as having the opposite quality. But also a critique of our habitual tendency to valorize one end of these pairs of opposites, to always prefer the beautiful over the ugly, the long over the short, and so, forth, and so on. And finally, in chapter 2, we are going to encounter for the first time a Taoist understanding of the idea of Wu Wei, of spontaneous virtuoso action. So now what we're going to do is move into chapter 2, and at this point, I will be relying on the translation of Red Pine. We're going to set aside this comparison of translations, but you're going to remember in the background that for every chapter of the Tao Te Ching we discuss, we'll be relying on a single translation, and there are hundreds of others, and that interpretation always lies behind translation. The translator, myself, this is something that I always try to bear in mind. Translation is always interpretation. There's a great Italian proverb, traditore, traditore. Translators are traitors. Whenever we translate a text, we do something to it. There's no way to avoid that. And then we present the text to a reader as the original text, and the poor reader doesn't know what's going on.